Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So uh, I'm Linda, um, and I did help um, co-found help. <laughs> um, and I invited today, uh, uh, a lot of you know me probably, if you attend the series, you know me from these, I'm uh, doing the technical help for this um, series. Um, but today I have with me three people who are integral to the creation of the series, um, who were there at the very beginning. Uh, and we're going to talk through um, the, uh, how we did it, like why we did it, how we did it, and then what the future holds for the help webinar series. Um, so to kick us off, uh, those of you, who, if you're not familiar with the help webinar series, um, it is now available or it has been available for a little while on YouTube. Um, and it, we will send out the links um, as well along the way. Uh, but it's a webinar series created by the North Carolina Library Association's Government Resources section um, as a way to uh, help educate both government information librarians and non-government information librarians about government information topics of a very wide variety. And so um, today we're just going to go through and give you a little bit about how we did it. So introduction and how it came about. I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer Behrens, who's going to talk about our origin story. Okay, yeah, I agreed to do the origin story because I was the secretary treasurer of the executive board of GRS at the time. Uh, Linda was the vice chair and Mimi was the chair. And this really came about at a January 2010 executive board meeting that we did over a video conference service called Dim Dim that we had all like frankly forgotten existed, I think, when we dug up the notes. Um, no longer is a thing, but it was at the time. And uh, there were a lot of parallels, I think, to the situation that we're in today. We were dealing with some economic fallout from the recession. People's travel budgets were, of course, frozen or non-existent. Uh, we were a pretty small section. NCLA was dealing with some budget shortfalls. And we were facing down sort of how, how do we sustain this section? How do we grow the membership when we're expecting a lot of government documents librarians are going to retire and those jobs are not going to be replaced. Someone else is just going to take over that position. So one of our first orders of business as the new incoming executive board at our first uh, conference call was, you know, how do we revitalize the section? We were looking at the time at doing a lot of like in-person trainings. We were pricing out uh, what it would cost to rent rooms in different places around the state. Uh, and it was not a great answer that we were getting from all of those places. So uh, we, we hit pretty quickly on the idea of a virtual, uh, virtual programming of some kind. You know, how could we do some, some virtual meetings? Um, so do you want to talk about Brian and Linda? Sorry, I can't find my unmute button. <laughs> um, so our first webinar, we actually, it's interesting looking at the notes, we started planning for this a, a more than a year in advance before we actually did the, um, the April 14th webinar. Um, but the first webinar was with Brian Akunin, who is a librarian at um, East Carolina University. And she had um, given talks, I believe, Mimi can jump in here on this, but given some talks around state on um, basics of government information and so we asked her to do our first webinar uh, to introduce people to the basics of government information this is one that is on our youtube channel and you can um, look at this one um, it's a nice introduction to the, the the branches of government that maybe some people in our government might want to actually look at but uh it, it really it was a great way to start out our our um, webinar series i think we picked on brian because she was she knew it she knew she'd been doing it and she knew how to talk about it and she knew the things that how to start off not to go off in the weeds or anything but how to get those basics and so she was tried and true and so we asked her to step up and be our um you say guinea pig exactly but um our expert to start us all off And I was uh, putting in the YouTube channel or in the chat the YouTube channel. If you have not seen that, you can go there and see the YouTube. Um, so this was a, the first session. Um, it, again, it was the basics, a general overview of um, uh, government information, um, looking at the three branches of government. Again, it is a great one if you have. Um, it's for basic government information literacy. If you have um, an info lit class in American politics or history, anything like that, and want to. Um, talk to students about um, the branches of government information, you can look at this and it'll give you an idea of how to teach that in an effective way. 
Um, so there was also the question of uh, what do we call this series? Um, and Mimi, I think you were going to talk a little bit about this one. Sure. Um, we did some brainstorming, as we used to call it. Um, and we wanted a catchy title because, as Linda said, we wanted this not to just um, appeal to uh, people that had already been doing government document information um, librarianship for a long time or had just been handed it formally. We wanted it to be used by anyone um, who is winds up trying to figure out that great morass of information um, that comes out of the federal government. So we played around with um, Sudden Government Documents Librarian. Um, I uh, think at that time, there was the book, Help I'm an Accidental um, Tourist had come out. And uh, so that started creeping into our talk. Um, there was, we had some, uh, you know, there, at that time, there was some um, difference of opinion about whether it should be called government documents or government information because we were moving from being mostly print documents to into more online documents coming from the, gov uh, the at the time, government printing office, which is now the government publishing office, everything changes. Um, so uh, we settled on the government information librarian. And I think I was the one that pushed to have the help in front <laughs> because <laughs> I always feel like I need more help than I've got. And, and I like the exclamation point um, because, you know, we just, sometimes I think we all feel like we're dangling out there and somebody comes at us with that question and we're just deer in the headlights. So we wanted to be that, um, that organization that helped wipe that look off the face, you know, at least you know something about it. Even if you don't know the minute details, you can kind of wind your way and find what you're looking for. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, that, uh, I like ex exclamation points. So that's where the exclamation point. But uh, the interesting thing too, is that it's become kind of known as help because it's too long um, of a title, I think. Um, so uh, there's definitely been a shortening over time to probably uh, just more help. Um, and I've seen a lot of mutated versions, like people will call it help uh, government information series and things like that. Or um, I think somebody called it a data series one time too. Nicknames are fine. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the content that counts. <laughs> um, and so this was really, it really wasn't supposed to be a series though. That was the interesting thing. It was going to be a one-off as a way to um, replace our in-person meetings that we'd done in off conference years. So our, our annual conference, or sorry, our, our state conference is every other year. Um, and so in the off year, we would do a, a GRS, a government resources section conference. Um, but we just couldn't do it that year. We couldn't figure out a way to do it. And so we were, this was meant to be a replacement for that. But Bryna, um, who, uh, who was the first presenter, said that she would only agree to do it if she, we would make it a series. Um, so that she was the one who really insisted that we create a series um, and keep it up. Um, and so that, uh, that that it became a series <laughs> it was the idea that maybe would happen for about a year um but instead it's been going on for quite a while so um and that's all thanks to linda <laughs> yeah well, for and, keeping and it going presenters. all that time yeah and all of our presenters who were very excited to do it so we're going to talk a little bit about um the logistics of it and how we actually keep this going and what and in the ways that we've been able to do it for so long uh, without any budget or any staff or any <laughs> other kind of support. Um, we've seen over time virtual platform changes. Dim Dim, as Jennifer mentioned, was our first platform um, that we met in. Uh, um, and it was a cloud-based task management system that was um, introduced. It was actually introduced in 2011, right when we started the webinar series, um, and then just discontinued in 2014. Um, we also used Blackboard Collaborate uh, it, for a long time. Um, and then in 2016, UNCG, where I was working, switched to WebEx, 
Um, and the interesting thing there for, uh, from a data management perspective, <laughs> if you want to get into that kind of stuff, um, is that we, we were linking on our website to all of the Blackboard Collaborate recordings rather than having a platform to actually put them in. So we weren't linking, we were just linking out to Blackboard. And when UNCG switched to WebEx, we were going to lose all of our links um, and all of the webinars that we had recorded. So I had to go through and download every single one of the webinars, which already by that time we probably, this was probably five years in. Um, so we had, what's five times 12? 60. <laughs> yeah, so we had at least 60 webinars, <laughs> around 60 webinars that we had to get out of Blackboard Collaborate um, and uh, make sure that we didn't lose them. And a couple of them did get unfortunately lost. Um, in the process. There was one in particular, I can't remember which one now, but that I wasn't, I didn't get it out um, for whatever reason. Uh, so that migration was why we ended up creating the YouTube channel, um, just because it was a place that we could actually assure that we would put these, um, the recordings uh, that wasn't connected to a university's um, uh, instance of uh, WebEx or Blackboard or whatever. Um, but the difficulty there, that's always a challenge, right? How do you manage that kind of um, migration, uh, especially when it's all volunteer organization and we're all doing it on our own time. Um, Blackboard Collaborate, the interesting thing too with that one and WebEx as well is that there was a lot less, uh, fewer people who actually knew how to, how to use those systems. Um, so we had to do a lot of practicing with the presenters at the time, uh, a lot more than we ever would have to do nowadays, I think, especially since COVID. Um, uh, and people had to give me their PowerPoints in advance and I had to upload them into the system. And that could take, I think, Michelle, your PowerPoints in particular sometimes took a long time <laughs> to upload into the system um, and uh, make them available through the system. Uh, so that, that has definitely we've seen it get a lot easier to do these kind of virtual um, webinars on the fly even um, it's it's gotten so much easier since I just wanted to add that in my notes I found your detailed instructions on um, illuminate checklist oh that, illuminate that was the name of it okay. go well it's it says illuminate and then it says if using blackboard make sure room link is available so somehow they must have interconnected yeah but very nice detailed instructions for the um, person to um, be able to actually do the program so yeah thank you again for uh, making sure people had that level of detail in order to be a presenter and that's what's the interesting thing is that you had to have that level of detail at that time to be a presenter whereas now it's just so much easier um, the software has changed and it's just nothing like we, I've, I've even forgotten we had created those, um, uh, that, those instructions. But a friend of mine and I created those instructions for two different webinar series. So, um, so yeah, it's gotten a lot easier, which is really nice. Um, in terms of the, the workflow, uh, some people, we thought some people would be interested in that. Um, the way it works now is we do a recording with WebEx meetings. I take it in Camtasia um, and then within Camtasia, uh, edit out. I used to do heavy edits, um, a lot of downtime, edit, trying to get it into a smaller package. Um, and lately, now I just um, edit the very beginning and, and maybe some of the end um, and leave the rest of it there. Um, so I bring it in Camtasia, um, edit a little bit, and then convert it to an MP4. And then we post it on, uh, I post it on YouTube um, and make it available that way. Um, in addition, I've got backups. <laughs> I've learned my lesson, so I have a, a locally saved uh, MP4. And the question now we need to start thinking about probably is where to actually archive at the um, the MP4 files, which is a question that if in an organization like this where we don't really have one place that we keep everything, how do we manage the backlog log of that? Um, uh, so. And then the other part of the workflow is the actual webinar organization. Um, for the first few years, I think I'd mostly, people would come to me and, and say that they were interested in doing things. And because there weren't that many webinar series, GRS help was pretty much it for a long time until FDLP started doing some. Um, 
we had a lot of volunteers. We had a lot of people who really wanted to get in there and, and do a presentation. Um, and it's not that we don't have volunteers anymore. It's just that there are more venues for this kind of content, I think. Um, a little bit more competition, um, not competition, uh, collaboration points. I don't know. <laughs> There's other opportunities that people have. And so our workflow has been, um, has had to change to accommodate both that and also the fact that I, I knew that I wouldn't be able to do it. It wouldn't be sustainable if I just did it by myself. Um, and so I wanted to create a way that, that make it sustainable. And one of the things we, I did was to create a Trello board, um, which if you've never used Trello, it's a really great tool, although I think they're having connectivity issues today. So <laughs> they actually crashed this morning, um, the entire site. But we used a Trello board to, uh, as a team, propose topics. Um, and you can see the, the, the workflow. So it goes from left to right on the Trello board. That's how you generally do the workflow. The first four, uh, column is going to be all of the jo just documents for everybody. Second column are ideas. Third column is schedule webinars that are scheduled. Um, fourth is webinars that are finished. So you just move these little, these are called cards, the little um, white blocks, and you can just move them along the Trello board as you get um, go through the process of scheduling and doing a webinar. And it also helped me get keep track of the recordings and to know if I had actually had uploaded a recording or if I was kind of delaying on that. Um, we also, within Trello, you can create template cards. So you can have a template. Um, and this was the template I created so that we could, um, anybody could go in and schedule a webinar. Um, usually this was Michelle, Rebecca, or Renee, who's also on the call and can talk to this. Um, but this allowed us to make sure all of the information was still there, uh, in the, it was there in the template for what we needed in order to be able to do the webinar. Um, so someone can go in and create a temp create a new card from this template and add in information about the presenter, the abstract, all of that, schedule a date, um, and then there's a checklist, very detailed checklist for everybody who is part of that webinar um, to go through and confirm that they've done those parts. So that's, um, you are welcome, this is a public Trello board, so y'all are welcome to go see this if you want to. Um, I love it, it's a great tool for managing workflows between in a team. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's been useful for us. And I can put that, um, I'll put the link in uh, the chat. Did anybody want to talk about this or have a comment on this? I'll just say that I found it tremendously useful for organizing each session. Uh, I got into this because I became, a, a, do we call them chapters? A section. I became a section chair after Linda and, uh, maybe two people after Linda. Anyway, all the details are specified. So all you have to do is fill in the form and it's a very clear process for organizing everything. And I think that's a key thing for making, I think people would say, let me know what you need or what you need help on um, for organizing a webinar series, but it, unless it's spelled out in the detailed checklist. Um, and I think I had read, I, I really think this is true. I read Checklist Manifesto about the same time that I created this and I realized like, well, let's make a checklist and then tell them what to do. Um, and it, it works. It works really well um, to keep teams on, a, on, on track. And um, I use it all the time in my uh, current job, which is mostly project management. So um, it's been super helpful in my life, except when it crashes like this morning. <laughs> And if you're interested, the, I just put it the link in the chat so you can take a look at that as well. All right. Um, the next fun topic is recruiting speakers. I'm going to pass it over to Michelle on this one. Is that right? Or maybe not. Yeah, so um, I, I, the reason that I'm involved in presenting today is because I actually have the distinction, I think, of having done the most presentations during this series. I've done six of them. Uh, and I, I think I was involved pretty early on, maybe not in the first year, but in 2012, I think that was the first time that American Fact Finder got a new interface. So, um, after I did that one, I kind of always had the series in mind. And so if I thought of a topic that seemed like a good one for the series, then I would reach out to Linda and say, hey, somebody should do this, or 
it, it was almost always originating with a topic rather than a speaker. Um, I think that we have had terrific luck in finding speakers for particular topics. And I think that the series has been a great opportunity for people who want to learn a particular topic to actually volunteer to teach it because you never learn a topic so well as when you plan to teach it to someone else. So that's always been sort of my strategy in recruiting speakers. We occasionally have had difficulty communicating with some people. Um, I'll, I won't say who, but uh, there was a federal agency that we tried to recruit for a topic and they kept saying they were gonna get back to us and they never did. So we eventually gave up on them. Um, but there were some folks who, you know, just because of time, they couldn't do it. And people were pretty comfortable telling you up front that it wasn't going to work out for them to do a particular time. So often what they would say is, well, I can't do it now, but maybe I could do it six months from now. And so we would write then and there schedule, all right, you're going to do it in April and we'll get back in touch with you in a few months and settle on a particular date. That was always my experience as a speaker. <laughs> I would uh, think of a topic and talk to Linda or Linda would reach out to me and I'd say, I can't do it until the summer. So all of my three on different legal research topics were like May and June because I could never do it during the school year but Linda would be like that's okay we're booked like eight months out you know we're so far out because everyone wants to do this so um, ended up working out really well but uh, so being flexible I think with the speakers really helped um, it was a very welcoming option to be a, a webinar speaker for me it was one of the most nerve-wracking presentation experiences not because the people were unfriendly but because the audience was so diverse and mm -hmm. you know talking about legal research to sort of public and general academic librarians are they're both libraries that I've worked in before my career as a law librarian so I know the types of questions that people are getting in those libraries and I know it's frequent and it was just very intense to try and distill you know a year's worth of legal research instruction in, in the law school setting to this different audience it was super rewarding but also just incredibly nerve-wracking <laughs> but a lot of fun too. I always enjoyed presenting to NCLA. I know I asked a, a friend of mine at work, um, Jane Johnson, she's an incredible genealogist to be a speaker. And mm -hmm. for her, it was a different experience because she was usually um, looking at all kinds of different platforms and all kinds of different materials and to ask her to narrow her focus down to basically government information. Um, she had to do a little work to recraft what she usually talks about but I think the more she looked at it the more she realized that she might not have realized she was actually using government information yeah um, oh, wow. you know second generation or second level or whatever um, and so I think she really um, liked doing the series she had not done anything like that before that she's an incredible um, genealogist. So she she fit right into the series. Awesome. And there's been a few like that where um, uh, some of the health topics that we had, which initially they were like, what a government? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like we can do this. We'll make it, you know, so yeah, it's been a few like that. that may have been a little bit tangential from government um, information traditionally defined, but um, definitely connections in there. Um, yeah, we should, we have a few people who are kind of getting up to be the five timers club, if you know SNL. Um, I think Michelle, uh, Jennifer, you've done three or four now. This is number four, if we're counting this one. Yeah. <laughs> the, the meta presentation about the presentations. Yeah, so I got and then, four. Oh, I don't Jeremy. think I was counting this one. Oh, yeah, <laughs> nice. And Jeremy Darrington is another one who's presented a lot. So we, we have a few people who are repeat speakers. And he made a joke at the last one about how I tend to strong arm people into 
to webinars um, or presenting, but it's not strong arming it so much as helping people to, I think, think through topics that they could possibly present on. So um, if you are interested in presenting, please get in touch with us. Own it, Linda. Just <laughs> <laughs> this is how she does it, folks. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's, it's recruitment. Um, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the impact um, of the series. We've definitely seen a wide variety of impacts. I think um, people have talked about it um, in different ways, but Michelle, I think you're talking about this one a little bit. Yeah, so I started collecting, not statistics exactly, but um, information about what we were doing in the series when I became the section chair. And one of the things that I was trying to think through was the distribution of topics that we had covered. So I made a little spreadsheet and went through all the past uh, topics that we had offered and distilled that into broad categories like federal agencies and data and stuff for the public, which clearly was totally subjective and different categories applied. Um, but over time, what we came out with uh, were some top categories of uh, the kinds of topics that we covered. So there were 30 sessions on data, 20 on the executive branch, 15 about international topics, 14 about federal agencies, and 13 for the public. Um, I think that was up through this, the October session. Um, I also wanted to mention for one of my sessions, uh, I must have been coming up on uh, reappointment. <laughs> and so I went through my registration list and actually added up how many states people were from. So that particular time in, oh, this one was actually offered in 2011. So that must have been my first one. There were 133 people registered from 37 states and provinces. So our impact is really not just within North Carolina, but across two countries. And then with the advent of loading the recorded sessions onto YouTube, we gained a whole nother way to keep track of statistics. So what you're seeing in the slide here is a view of what Linda sees when she goes into our channel administration screen. So you can see that we've had more than 22,000 people, almost 23,000 people view the recordings. Um, I know that when I was teaching the government information class at the library school here at UNC, regularly I would assign some of these recordings for people to watch for particular topics. Um, depending on you know what I wanted to do with those topics, I might view the video several times myself. So I know that we have repeat views in here um, from both professionals and students. When I was uh, writing a recommendation for Linda for the series, an award for the series last year, I jotted down some uh, information about views for particular recordings. And I wasn't so much looking at um, individual titles as just how many views different recordings had gotten. Um, some of the older recordings had already accrued at more than a thousand views and a session that was just uh, live in this past July has already been viewed more than 70 times. So the YouTube channel really extends the life of these recordings a lot. 
And that I think is uh, evidenced by the next slide that we're going to show. Uh, so you can see the the number one recording is was the APIs of data.gov, um, which was actually in 2016, um, and it's gotten 3,000 views. Um, and the interesting thing is that we've had more comments. Some of them are spammy, but we've had a couple of comments on this uh, on this webinar recently. And uh, one person saying, even though this is four years old, there's lots of good information here. <laughs> it's just now you can do things differently. And so, um, so that's a, it's really fun that people are actually finding some of the older stuff and still finding use to, for in it. Um, and certainly, order in the court, uh, Jennifer's. Um, 2015 is that 2015 webinar yeah that was the second one. one yeah that one's been a really popular one too especially people asking law questions on oh, the no. YouTube channel, um, which which you haven't been forwarding to me no, Thank you. Not. <laughs> um so so there's that brings up an interesting issue of, of the public needing you know assistance um with things uh sometimes so uh, Geocoding for Beginners, another one that's a lot. Uh, another Jennifer one, Legal Research Without the Law Library. Um, Making Elections Great Again was um, this summer, or sorry, it was in November of 2016. Apparently that one's a very popular one. Um, and Secrets of the Congressional Record, which is my favorite. If you are, um, this is Bryna Kunin, who was our first presenter ever. And she goes through and talks about the history of the congressional record. And it's just, it's super fun. It's a really fun um, webinar. Um, if you're interested in more historical topics. Um, so we've been uh, looking, I've been looking through these and trying to figure out if there are places we need to expand. Um, and we are going to do an updated version of the API to data.gov in February um, with Julia, who did that original webinar. One of my favorite uh, comments about the series was that in 2018, someone who had, was new to government documents and had just joined GovDocL, the national listserv, put out a request to people of, how do I learn to do this government documents thing? And the state librarian of Rhode Island wrote back and said, you should look into the help series. That's really gonna help you. And she suggested our series before she suggested the FTLP Academy. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, and I, I've seen a lot of people on GovDocL uh, encouraging people to take a look at the series. So it's definitely something that's, and it's not me all the time. <laughs> Sometimes it's me, but not always. Um, but uh, it's definitely feels real, very nice when we hear people who are had that much, respect it that much. Um, and I think one of the things I've also heard is that because it's coming from a librarian's perspective where people, you know, the people are willing to say what's not great about a source as well as what's great about it. Um, so what are the challenges that you're going to have? And I think there's a lot of truthfulness in these webinars, especially Michelle's that tend to be <laughs> cries well, They're all about data. data. <laughs> yeah. um, but there, there's a lot of truthfulness. It's not a marketing ploy. It's, you know, we do sometimes have people who are creating their own products, but um, it is really meant to be from a user's perspective and how to use these sources. While we're speaking about our favorites, I want to take a second just to shout out some of the stuff that maybe isn't in the most popular of all time because it's such a niche topic. And my favorite from that is one who the speaker I actually recommended, which was the um, understanding the budget of the United States, so budget and appropriations research by a friend of mine, full disclosure, Morgan Stoddard, who I had, I had seen her present a session like that at a law librarian conference. And it was a pretty small group and I thought, this would be such a great, we were about probably halfway into help at that point, and I thought this would be just a fantastic help session and connected her with Linda. And, you know, budget research is one of those things, like for me, I don't have to do it a lot, but when I have to, I have to learn it all over again. <laughs> so, like, I've gone back to that, um, and it's just a really succinct and accessible overview. So that's that's my vote for my, my personal favorite, although the Secrets of the Congressional Record was really great, too. I agree with Linda. Yeah, that was that budget one was very good. Um, and a couple of the UN ones too are, are super, um, really, really good. So if you have a favorite, feel free to put it in the chat. <laughs> you can do recommend people, or if you want to put your own, because there's a few presenters in here um, in our group today. Um, 
So looking ahead, and this last part, so just to close this out, we're going to um, kind of open up in discussion because I wanted to talk about kind of the future of webinars, um, especially both related to government documents and government information, and then more broadly. Um, and so I had some questions that I wanted both the panel and then uh, anybody else who wants to talk about these, if you have ideas on, on these. Um, first off, it's thinking about, you know, we traditionally government information has focused on um, print collections and then it's moved into the more digital realm. And then, so, but how do we handle, you know, the need for or access to, for access to the historical record that might not actually be digitized yet? <laughs> especially in a virtual world um, and thinking through those issues. How can we support GovInfo librarians moving forward um, in uh, what is going to be, I assume, an increasingly virtual world um, for our work? Um, uh, ways that we can support all kinds of librarians, ways we can support the public, um, like those people who were asking law legal questions on our Zoom channel. Um, how do we avoid contributing to Zoom fatigue? <laughs> um, and then other topics that we would like to do do in the future. So I don't know which one we want to jump into here, but if y'all want to choose one. Since I've been looking at our collection a lot, um, the print collection um, is, a, is a tough thing to handle. Um, you've got sets huge sets that have been collected over decades. And to me, it, once GPO has a set scanned or digitized or whatever your terminology is, and it's an official set, then in my situation, I feel like, okay, I can let go of that print. But there are quite a number of sets that that has not happened to. And I'm really surprised about them um and it's harder for me to let go of those print sets if there's not an official nice neat you know you click here and here's all the volumes and you can just open them up and it's free and very visual um the um treaties t-a-i-s t-i-a-s i don't think anybody's done that set there are some of them on the State Department's website, but they're not all there. And I'm very surprised that, you know, a university or somebody hasn't just gone ahead and done the set. Um, so that kind of figuring out what you've got, what has been used, is it worth hanging on to it because it's been there so long. <laughs> it's just such an impressive body of work um, versus is anybody want to go come all the way to main library to look at these things? Whereas if it was, if I could give them a link, they would be so much happier. So are there other comments on the, how are y'all dealing with, I mean, Jennifer, I guess you're in your library, but Michelle, I don't know if you're actually going to the library. I'm not time. usually here. Uh, just oh, okay. Internet here than at home, but I can be here, and the public can't be here. So that's definitely something as a government information professional that I think about a lot. That um, mm. we've been essentially closed to public access since we went into the shelter in place in in mid March, and we were closed to our community for a good chunk of the summer. We've slowly started having um, students and faculty and staff coming back in, but um, it's nothing like it used to be. So we do have to focus primarily on the virtual, but we've already, we all know, I mean, not everything's online. It's I, I, looking back at the, the sessions I did five years ago, I remember having to scan a lot of the print materials because it just, I can't show it to you if I can't use the print. Mm -hmm. um, and that hasn't changed. I mean, there's just so many parallels between then and now thinking about the amount of accidental government documents librarians that are going to be coming up as the same thing happens that was happening in 2010 like people will retire or leave positions and those positions won't be filled people are going to have to fill that gap for them so i think we're, we're going to see another wave of the accidental librarians um which is hard to think about but 
maybe we're in a I good agree. position. We're in a better position now than we were 10 years ago, I think, with virtual Absolutely. instruction to handle it. I agree. Um, what I saw when I was teaching, I got to a point where I couldn't continue teaching the government information class at SILS. And indications from SILS are that it's not going to be offered anymore. There wasn't enough demand in terms of students enrolling in that class for them to go to the trouble to locate another instructor. And I even got pushback from my students. My class was at least as much oriented towards finding print documents as it was using some of the commercial databases to find documents. And some of my students were very vocal about why should we learn these print things? You know, it's all going to be online. Well, it's not yet <laughs> online. And I have my doubts about whether all of it will ever be online. <laughs> so I, I think that I'm, I'm sorry, I was going to jump in. Another thing I'm a little worried about is if it, it if it's online now, will it stay online? Yeah, just like the 1990 census. I was so excited that that was online and it was in a database and you could manipulate it and da da da. da. <clears throat> not, not anymore. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, allow thinking you know, moving to more vendors having it, <laughs> having these things, right? Like for ProQuest, statistical abstracts or, or things like that. It's not necessarily going to work for the, the general, or it's not going to work for the general public if libraries can't subscribe to these alternate sources, which can provide access to those, um, those things, but in a way that's more manipulable or, or user friendly, but, um, but it, it comes with a cost, right? So that's the other issue. Um, I think let's talk a little bit about um, the Zoom fatigue thing because this is something I worry about. <laughs> Somebody who organizes the webinar series, how do we move forward and, and avoid contributing to the Zoom fatigue that we all seem to have? Do you think are there ways yeah, that we this, can? This is my fourth Zoom of I think six today. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> that's not typical, but. Uh... It's definitely on the high side. I I just I don't know. I I really I struggle with it because we do recognize it's a thing, but at the same time it's such a great opportunity to provide free and wide reaching instruction that mm -hmm. I guess keeping it short, keeping it focused, um, you know, really delivering this is always a good thing for a webinar to do, and not everyone did it, but you know, you do what you say you're going to do. And that's always my number one pet peeve, whether it's an in-person conference or a virtual presentation is like the description and the reality are just <laughs> two completely different things. But I think that's like the best that we can do under these circumstances. And I think um, Joe had a really good idea um, there about have, having them be a little more conversational, I think helps with fatigue. Um, that you know, one of the things we we used to we were talking about this earlier. We used to never have the the cameras live, and it was partly because of bandwidth, <laughs> because it wasn't always clear whether or not the webinar would work <laughs> if we did if we had cameras on. And so, uh, being able to now accommodate cameras on and and uh, multiple people talking or multiple cameras on, I think, is a is a nice thing that's changed a lot. Um, that interaction is good also when um, when live, of course, not so much in recordings, polls, surveys can keep attention focused. Yeah, and that's something we've, I think we've, um, some people have uh, experimented with that within uh, web, the, this series, but it's definitely something that uh, we can do more of, I think. Um, I would also say that as much as I agree that we're having Zoom fatigue and uh, it's frustrating to try to figure out how to reduce that fatigue. The importance of platforms like this for connecting people when we can't be physically together is enormous. Mm -hmm. So being able to see y'all's faces is pretty wonderful for me. I've, I've been working at home since March uh, I haven't been back into work on a regular basis at all since March. 
and I don't expect to be until like next summer, until we have a vaccine and things are able to get back to normal. So at least that aspect is a really good thing. Yeah, that, I mean, it definitely, uh, it's been nice for me too, because I have gotten to see people I wouldn't, haven't seen in years probably, except maybe at conferences. Um, and yeah, I think doing other platforms besides Zoom <laughs> is a good way to, <laughs> thank you Natalia and, and Joe for talking about that. That's a, another thing that we um, probably could try and do maybe. So I want to get to this one because I'm selfish. It, what topics haven't we covered? <laughs> or to what topics would you like to see us do? in the future? Um, are there things that we haven't done or that you would like to see a redo of um, going forward in the help series? I always, the more census, the better. Michelle, <laughs> I need, I need data, census.data.gov, data.census.gov 101. That thing is, that's killing me. I just, <laughs> I think we just did that one this summer and uh, I'm sure that I'll do it again not too distantly in the future because things keep changing over there. Any other? Says oh, do you have Yeah. Um, Data sets and what Dominique says. Oh, it's Eleanor. Hi, Eleanor. <laughs> I know her. Dominique says anything about finding and using government data sets and who they might be useful for. Okay. Dominique, are you, what kind of library are you in? Public or academic? Mm. Okay. Yeah, so I think even just a intro to government data 101 kind of thing might be an interesting way to take it, like how to think about the statistical agencies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that would be an interesting one um, that we might try and do at some point. That I, I would like to see something like that. I think we had something similar to that a long time ago, but we can do an update on that. Have we had a DOD, the other comment? Um, David, who, Dur David Durant, uh, is he Durant or is he? He's still here. I think he just left. Um, David Durant did uh, one, I think, on the De Department of Defense, but um, I can get in touch with him and see uh, in a few years. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I can try and see if I can find somebody who could do a, a, data, a Defense Department one. That would be an interesting one. I recall that we used to do, there was the evaluation form would always ask like what, what yeah. topics. And I think that was one of the ways that Linda got around to me um, for one of mine was like legal research is something everyone's asking for on these forms. And so I was all in for that. But yeah, if, if people have suggestions, I think it's a lot of it's been driven by the suggestions if I'm remembering right. Oh, and this Brenda's got a, so the, yeah, the, um, uh, Preservation of info and websites as administrations change. So we could do one on the government crawl, on the web crawl of uh, government, the presidential websites, because there's a bunch of people who work in that. And and David has offered to do one on DOD. So that would be fun. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're running into the end of our time. Um, uh, oh, cool. So maps and CIA. Awesome, yeah, that was great ideas, guys. That was great. Um, so the final thing that we wanna just uh, talk about, and you can keep the ideas coming for webinars. Um, we'll definitely, I'll definitely grab the chat so that I can um, keep track of those. Um, but before people start running off, I just wanna announce something. <laughs> um, uh, the government resources section has, um, uh, the leadership of the government resources sec section has um, agreed with Godort um, to, uh, have Godort take over the HELP webinar series. Um, part of the things that we noticed is that, well, I, what I've noticed is that the, we don't ha appeal just to North Carolina libraries, um, well, for one, and then also we need a way to make it sustainable in the long term if it's something that people are interested in having exist. <laughs> and because I'm no longer in North Carolina, um, you know, people, people move and so you can't always, rely on one person always being the, the point person for a series. And, and the series has just gotten a lot bigger. Um, so at this point, 
we are going to move into um, a relationship with Godort, um, which uh, it had just created an ad hoc committee to take over, um, to look into the process of taking over the help series. Um, and uh, this is going to be the inaugural, inaugural webinar as a Godort GRS joint series will be January 21st. Um, and that gives Godort about a, sem a semester or so to um, figure out the logistics um, to make sure that we can uh, either put it in the committee or create a new committee code. Godort is a large bureaucracy and so <laughs> it takes time to do these things. And so um, they'll look at the process of in absorbing the or bringing the webinar series into Godort. And if you're not familiar with Godort, it is the Government Documents Roundtable um, through American Library Association. Um, so that will start in January 21st or January 2021. Um, so Linda, I want to thank you for shepherding that to make sure that this series continues and also for being clear with Godort that this has to remain an accessible series. Part of the deal of it being free to everybody who wants to participate is really important to all of us. Yeah, so and it, that's the that's also important to go to it, that it not be something that is going to be, you know, we, we're not going to suddenly put it behind a paywall um, or make people pay for it in this. But we may do those other kinds of pay for webinars and go to it, but help will remain free um, as long as go to it is uh, the leadership for it. Um, so that's exciting and I'm, um, I'm hoping that it helps with the sustainability of the series the long term. If it's something that you're interested, if you're a member of Godort and you're interested in contributing to um, the series going forward, uh, it's a great way to learn about how to do a webinar series. So I encourage you to get in touch with me um, and it's, uh, uh, you can learn more about how to get involved with this new initiative. Um, thank you very much. Uh, any questions, comments? from the floor or from our uh, attendees. And thank you, Jane, for saying that's a wonderful resource. Panelists, do you have any final thoughts? Well, thank you, Linda, for all your years. We appreciate it. Um, awards are one thing, but you know, knowing that there are a lot of people out here that really appreciate what you've done and how you've kept this going, and been the point person and they had the technology, the understanding and the knowledge to, to actually make it happen. I hope you appreciate that we all know that and that we really, really thank you. Thank you, that's very sweet. <laughs> yeah, I second that emotion. I don't think we'd be at 100 webinars today if it were not for all of Linda's hard work and dedication. Like this is very much a labor of love and a lot of work as you saw from the Trello board. <laughs> Well, thank you. But it's also a labor, a community labor. And that's, I just, I mean, I've done a lot of, of logistical work, but the communities are the ones that um, come in. The community is, are the ones who provided the content. <laughs> and that was not me. And it's, it takes a lot to either teach about something that you don't know about or learn about something and teach about it. Um, to pull these together, it takes a lot of time. And I'm very cognizant of the time that people have put into this. So thank you to the community. Um, for being willing to be part of it. I learned a lot, that's for sure. So we'll, we're gonna definitely be moving forward and um, with help and um, excited to see what the future holds for. So thank you. All right, well, thank you guys. Yeah. <laughs> see you all on January 21st. Woo woo. Let me know if you have topics. Do the dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.